afternoon. My name is Wendy Dawson and I'm the Chief Brand Officer for Victory Offices. And today we're talking about myth busting of ergonomics. Um, the, the webinar is a little bit near and dear to all of our hearts as we've all had to come to terms with ergonomics, especially over these past two years. But before I get too involved into the, the session, I would like to, even though this is a webinar, I would like to pay our respects on behalf of Victory Offices and our guests attending today to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional land of the Kulin Nation and that we pay our respects to elders, both past and present, and elders from other communities who may be joining us today. All right, so ergonomics. Um, we probably, you know, as I mentioned, we all probably think we're probably a little bit of an expert on the topic because of the last two years and the and what um, we've had to endure. Uh, but probably we don't know as much as we think we do. We probably um, uh, have a few myths that um, we cling to that probably aren't aren't actually accurate. So we are delighted to have two gentlemen with us today that are actually going to dispel the the myths associated with ergonomics, such as kneeling chairs are best for people with back pains, or standing all day is better than sitting, or taking a break every two hours is adequate, and, and the list goes on. But um, we've got Daniel Rinsberg and Michael Armitage, um, who are joining us from Active Health Online. So who are our residents in the house? So I've got a little bit of a bio, and I am gonna read this, because otherwise, um, uh, I may not be getting all of their credentials, um, and let's, I do want to make sure that we you know, understand whose trusted hands you're in. So Daniel Grinberg has been in the health and well-being industry for over 20 years, having graduated from RMIT with a prestigious five-year double degree in chiropractic and applied science in 2004. Daniel is the founder and director of Southeastern Active Health and Active Health Online. He is passionate about helping people improve their lives through better health and lifestyle choices and working with organizations to support their growing remote workforces with innovative WHS and well-being solutions. Michael Armitage is the guy that makes Daniel look good. All right, that was a little bit of an ad lib, but Michael is the occupational physiotherapist and injury prevention specialist, and also the operations manager for Active Health. With over 20 years of experience in private, public, and corporate, corporate and industrial health settings, both here in Australia and overseas in the UK. Michael specializes in helping businesses develop and implement proactive solutions to reduce the cost of workplace injury and cultivate a positive workplace culture that prioritizes health, safety, and well being. But what is Active Health Online? What does it do? It's a team of occupational health professionals with a passion for helping people find better ways of working through human centered workspace design. AHO was created to help organizations support people working remotely during the pandemic. Since that time, AHO has continued to respond to the changing landscape of work in Australia with innovative WHS and wellbeing solutions targeted at optimizing the health, safety, and wellbeing of workers wherever they're located. So Michael and Daniel both have uh, an incredible um, uh, presentation and wealth of knowledge that they're going to share with us. No doubt questions will come up as we progress through this, but I'm going to ask that everybody hold their questions to the end. Um, feel free to put them through in the chat box, but let's, um, let's hold the Q&A to the end and that way we can actually have a robust um, round of questioning then. So without further delay, over to you, Michael. Thanks so much, Wendy. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, and thanks for the kind words. I'm not sure about uh, making Daniel look good, but nevertheless, I'll take that one. Okay. Um, so yes, dispelling ergonomic myths is what we're going to do today, because uh, there are many, and there's a wealth of information online, which, um, which people have to try and wade through uh, when it comes to trying to 
implement ergonomic change, whether it be for themselves or, or for their employees. So I've, um, over the years, I've done uh, worked with a lot of businesses, as you've mentioned, um, and, uh, and individuals in trying to facilitate economic change. And probably the biggest myth that um, is, is a roadblock to that change is the misconception that um, ergonomics is expensive. Somewhere along, along the line, the, uh, the, the waters got a bit muddied and ergonomics became uh, synonymous with equipment. And since then, there's many companies who have specialised in producing uh, lots of shiny, fancy equipment for our, for our wellbeing. But the truth is really that ergonomics um, is, is not all about that. So I'll pop our, our presentation up now. Okay. So ergonomics is really the science of optimizing human well-being through design. Okay, so simply this means looking at the way humans work and interact with each other and with the tasks uh, that they're tasked to do and looking at ways we can improve that to reduce the chance of in injury and optimize people's health. Um, and if we're looking at workstation ergonomics and particularly over the last couple of years uh, with the movement to working from home, um, we've seen a lot of uh, situations where ergonomics is, is called for, but hasn't been implemented. And, and one of the biggest reasons for this is, once again, the misconception that it's gonna cost a lot of money. Uh, this is for both individuals and organizations. Um, so uh, an employer faced uh, with trying to outfit the workspaces of their entire workforce working from home, um, it, almost uh, without exception, the first question uh, that we're asked is how much is this going to cost us? But um, look, in many cases, workstations can be set up without spending any money. And it's more about um, using the equipment that's available and adjusting it for the purposes and meeting the needs of the individual. So for instance, um, the common, most of the common issues we encountered uh, with working from home is that workers were sent home uh, with laptops and were then uh, required to cobble together their own workspace at home. And typically they were using uh, dining chairs or tables they procured from Ikea. Um, Michael, I'm yes. just gonna stop you right there. Apologies. Can you reshare your screen? Ah, yes, sure. Sorry about that. That's all right. I think it was a technical error on my end. Perfect. There you go. Ahmed will go. make all of this look Sorry perfect. about that. Don't worry. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, yes. Um, and, and yeah, so, so they, they were the main issues that people were working from laptops and on their dining room tables or, or bedroom tables and, and using tables they bought from Ikea and things like this. To, and obviously these weren't uh, ideal for their purposes two years later when they were still finding themselves working from home. So, um, but they didn't have to buy new equipment or uh, sit stand desks and things like that. Simple, simple interventions such as uh, using pillows to bolster their position to raise them up if their desk was too low, um, using things like books to reposition their monitors, um, or even things like chalking up the desk with, a, with pieces of timber um, can make a simple uh, workstation actually work, work for anyone. So cost, simple cost-effective measures like that um, just require a little bit of thinking outside of the box. Um, also, if, we look, if we're, we are looking at equipment, um, the actual uh, the things that we most commonly recommend uh, for people working from home on laptops uh, are so affordable these days, but still it amazes me that people aren't aware of it. So um, for instance, a laptop stand, which immediately uh, will improve a worker's posture who's working from the laptop, um, available for under $30. Similarly, a monitor arm, a um, uh, simple but really uh, effective tool for, for helping uh, optimize space on a desk and position the monitor appropriately. Again, you can, you can purchase something like this for under $50. And an external keyboard, which is a really essential item if you're using a laptop for prolonged periods of time. Um, again, you can pick this up for under $20. So for less, less than $100, you can set yourself up there with, a, with an ergonomic laptop workstation. Um, so that's, but really it's not about equipment at all because when we look, when we talk about ergonomics, we're really talking about uh, educating people. Um, it's, uh, again, we want to try and get away from the idea of equipment. Um, so it's really about helping people understand their own posture, um, develop postural, postural awareness. And when they, when they do understand um, 
how this uh, relates to their own tasks, their own work and, and their own life, they can then be empowered to actually uh, change the way in which they work. Um, so, and, and this is gonna have huge benefits for them going on uh, in the future and you know, outside of their work as well. So it's, um, uh, training is one of the most important things, I think, um, when it comes to, to ergonomics. Um, it's one thing to set someone up, but if, if, uh, if the individual doesn't really understand uh, why that change has been made and why that's relevant for them, then we've, we've not really made a difference in that person's life. We've really created a, a dependence again on, on the health professional to tell someone what to do when, when it's not really about that. Um, so look, even the most ergonomic workstation is, uh, is going to cause issues is, is if you sit all day. So it's really, at once again, more about facilitating uh, that change in the way we're working um, and um, empowering people to you know, take control of their own, uh, their own situation and their own lives. Okay. So we'll move on to the next slide now. Daniel, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. And thank you, Wendy. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Daniel, and I'm the founder and director of Active Health Online. Um, myth number two, this is a really big one. And this is something that we see, or that I certainly see at my clinic a lot. Uh, people um, tell me that they go to the gym and they do all this exercise, and then they get to work and they sit all day, but it's okay because they've done their exercise in the morning. So um, I hate to break it to you, but it doesn't actually work that way. Unfortunately, um, what the latest research does show is that uh, sitting for continuous periods of time, so uninterrupted sitting for long periods of time, um, is not, uh, the, I guess the, the detriments or the negative effects of that is not actually negated by doing exercise either in the morning or in the evening. And the key really is to continually move during the day. So that we know that if you're, let's say, a full-time sedentary worker, you work at a computer, unfortunately, what the research shows is that you're actually at greater risk of health, um, health, health issues compared to people that, let's say, have more active roles. They might be carpenters or tradies and they're out and about. And some of these health risks, unfortunately, um, can lead to things like more chronic conditions. So we're talking about things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, even things like low energy levels and uh, mental health issues like anxiety and depression. Um, these risks can be reduced by uh, good ergonomics and certainly doing exercise, but the key to this one is to keep moving. So just to give you a bit of an understanding of why this is important, let me take you through what actually happens to our bodies when we sit for a long period of time. When we sit and we don't move very often, we're actually exposed to um, an imbalance of stress on the body. So there's some uh, muscles in the body that are active all the time, and then there are other muscles in the body that become inactive. And what happens over a period of time is this slowly builds irritation and stress on our body. And that can lead to things like neck and shoulder pain, low back pain, general stiffness, and also fatigue. Apart from the muscle and joint issues, when we do sit for a long period of time, it also affects our organs. So if you think about the sitting posture, maybe slouching forward a little bit, maybe what you look like when you're looking at your phone, the compression on your chest and your lungs and the, um, the, the impact on your diaphragm means that the way that we breathe is affected. We're not breathing as efficiently or effectively, and that can lead to reduced oxygen levels in our blood, which can lead to that, um, you know, two o'clock, three o'clock, I'm starting to feel a little bit fatigued. I'm starting to lose my concentration. And what do we do? we go to the vices that we know are going to pep us up. We're going to eat something very, very sweet, or we're going to go for that caffeine. And unfortunately, it does do the job in the short term, but we know that if we continue to expose our bodies to those sorts of, um, let's say, unhealthy practices, it can lead to more issues down the track in terms of putting on weight, uh, become reliant or addicted to sugar or caffeine. And that can also lead to mental health issues like stress and anxiety. The other thing that sitting in a slouch posture can sometimes do is it actually creates compression on our organs. And when that happens, our ability to digest our food is also affected. So it's kind of like a double whammy. We don't breathe very well. We don't digest our food very well. And it's really hard for our bodies to function. So what do we do about it? It's really simple. 
we just need to incorporate regular movement into our day. The advice is to move three minutes for every 30 minutes of sitting. Now you might think, wow, that sounds like a lot. How am I supposed to get my work done? But it's actually pretty easy. If you think about how often you uh, stop writing that email to check your phone, you might be checking some messages, you might be in between meetings at work. It's a really simple way to take that opportunity to get up from your chair and to move around a little bit. And all we wanna do is think about moving our bodies, uh, all the joints and muscles in our body. We might do some calf raises, we might do some simple squats, things like turning your neck from side to side, rolling your shoulders, reaching your arms up above your head. All these sorts of things can help your body move better. And then we always encourage people to take a couple of really nice deep breaths to help reoxygenate the blood. What that does is it actually increases your energy levels helps with your concentration and productivity. All right, Michael, I'll let you take the next one. No problem. Okay, this one's a little bit more lighthearted, but we're talking about kneeling chairs and I'm not sure if uh, our viewers are familiar with what I'm talking about, but you can see in the picture there, uh, a chair that's designed for us to sit on in the kneeling position. Okay, now these were designed in the 70s. Um, I'm sure most of us have encountered one at one point um, I think we had one, I think it was orange carpet back in the day, my parents. Um, so anyway, so a lot of people still ask me, um, should I get a kneeling chair? Uh, I've got low back pain. I've heard they're, they're, they're the best type of chair for me. Okay, so we want to try and examine some of the, uh, the pros and cons of these chairs and give you a couple of other options about things that are, things are a little bit better that you can make a choice with. So I'll share a bit of an anecdote as well. So um, if, a few years ago, I'd been suffering a lot of low back pain um, at work and a colleague of mine who was a doctor one day presented me with a kneeling chair. And um, so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll try it. Um, I later, later discovered that he'd found it that morning on the hard rubbish on his way to work. So um, hence my, uh, <laughs> My association forever then with kneeling chairs being synonymous with um, with hard rubbish day. But I, you know, I have seen them there alongside the cat scratches. And so I think there's a reason for that, um, which I'll tell you about now. Okay, so pretty obviously you can see from the previous slide that of the gentleman on the kneeling chair, um, they, were, they were designed to place us in a more upright position with our hips opened out, uh, as opposed to a sitting position where the hips are about 90 degree angle. Um, that's great, and, and that's certainly a positive element for these chairs. But unfortunately, they place a lot of stress on our knees and ankles due to the position that you know, we have to place our legs in while on these chairs. So while it might be good for your lower back pain, a lot of people then pay the price of re aggravating old injuries in their knees and ankles or even causing new ones because uh, our knees placed in that fully bent position uh, can affect our joints, but it also can cause shortening of our hamstring muscles uh, kept in their shortened position all day, uh, as well as our calf muscles down, uh, down our legs and, and our ankles as well, kept in a fully what we call plantar flex position. Um, so it also restricts the circulation in the legs and that kneeling position can also put pressure on nerves and other structures, um, which can then lead to other issues. Um, I remember when I was using it as well, uh, I found it quite difficult uh, just moving in and out uh, from my from my work position. Um, so they're not the easiest chairs to move around in or, or get around in. And also I used to get a lot of cramp in those muscles in my calves. Anyone who's, who, know, who might have experienced that kneeling position and getting cramp in your calves or your, or your hamstrings, uh, that used to happen quite a bit. So look, what, what I tend to recommend these days is a much better alternative is uh, we can see uh, in the image there, um, is, a, is a sit stand stool or a saddle seat. That particular one's a saddle seat. So these are seats that are designed, you can see they achieve an open hip angle somewhere between sitting and standing, um, but they don't have any of the problems associated with kneeling chairs and putting pressure on elsewhere. Uh, so these type of chairs are fantastic. Uh, they promote healthy posture and movement. Uh, they open up your, your thorax, your diaphragm, and enable better breathing. So you get all the benefits of actually moving and being standing. And they're also really good for industries. So you'll see them a lot in uh, medical settings, uh, industrial settings, uh, workshops, and also you know, creative settings like that, because they just uh, enable you to scoot around your workspace and very easily transition from uh, between sitting and standing. 
So um, uh, in a nutshell, um, much better options than the kneeling chair. Some people will still be attached to them. That's, that's fine. If it works for you, no need to change. Uh, but I'd encourage you to consider the other options that are available. Okay, over to you, Daniel. I think you're taking care of this one, Michael. Oh, am I? Okay. <laughs> no problem. Okay. One moment. <laughs> Sorry for the mix up. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, we've just been talking about the negative uh, impact of sitting. Uh, so one would logically assume the answer would be to stand. Um, but obviously, uh, it's, uh, we, we can concede that there may be some drawbacks for that. Um, so I will, just want to tell you a little bit about some of the negative impacts of prolonged standing uh, compared to sitting and explain to you how you can achieve a bit of a balance between the two. Okay. So a bit of background as well, I'll share another anecdote with you that um, when, I, when, when I started working from home during the pand pandemic, I had to set up my workspace and decided I would set it up for, to allow me to alternate between sitting and standing. And, but I didn't have a hard adjustable desk. So I have a bit of woodwork experience. I cobbled together a, a, a makeshift raise, a, a desk raise and placed it on my desk. But the problem was that taking that off on and off of the desk every half an hour uh, just wasn't practical. So I ended up sitting, uh, sorry, standing for most of the day. So I decided I'd, I'd, I'd do a little bit of an experiment with myself as a subject and, and see what happened uh, to my body um, with prolonged standing. So for six weeks, I, uh, I stood at my desk. Um, I used an anti-fatigue mat, which is just a, a thick rubber mat designed to take the, the pressure off of your joints in weight bearing. Um, and I pretty much stood for about nine hours a day with having a, a half hour sitting break for lunch. And I, I sat in the evening, so I, I wasn't too, um, I didn't take this too intensely, but I, sat I stood during the workday. Um, what happened? So I, I I suffered from a, a low-grade Achilles tendonitis previously, which was which was okay. It wasn't okay after a few weeks. Suddenly, I was waking up limping, uh, and at the same time, an old hip injury uh, resurfaced. I started to get pain in, in the balls of my feet, and a little bit of low-grade plantar fasciitis, which is an inflammatory condition of the, the soft tissue under the arch of your foot. I started to get low back pain, uh, and it became worse and worse as the six weeks progressed. My knees became sore. And on top of it all, I, I was really, really exhausted at the end of, end of every day, um, which is, you know, that may have been one payoff. You know, I was burning more calories. Uh, there, is, uh, there's, there are some studies out there that show that you do burn more calories from uh, standing as opposed to sitting. But I think the, uh, the benefits didn't really outweigh the negatives in this situation. So. Obviously, a balanced, a balanced approach is best. Um, there's definitely an increased risk of injury to our muscles and tendons, wear and tear in our joints, and also vascular problems like uh, varicose veins. Uh, and fatigue is a real issue. Um, I, I'd find that uh, rather than standing with good posture, I would, I would be leaning on my desk uh, after a few hours. And I quickly realized I just actually just wasn't fit enough to stand for that long. And, and like, I don't think any of us are, it's not healthy. And it's the reason why uh, industries that have workers uh, in standing positions will, will use things like sit stand stools uh, so that uh, workers can stand for, for temporarily and then just relax down on a chair. Um, so look, what, what the research has shown is that alternating between sitting and standing every 30 minutes is ideal. Um, and if you wanna break that down into a, into a little bit of an hourly routine, what we recommend is that you sit for 30 minutes stand for 20 minutes and then move or exercise for 10 minutes. And that doesn't mean you don't, you don't have to work, you can't, start, uh, you can't continue working during that period of movement. There are very simple exercises that you can do while at your desk um, that don't mean you have to, have to leave your desk and stop working so you can maintain your productivity. But that's a good ratio to try. So if you have a sit-stand desk uh, at home, I'd encourage you to try that routine. If you don't have a sit-stand desk, um, the idea is just to incorporate movement every half an hour and you'll, you'll achieve the same benefits. Okay. All right, over to you, Daniel.
There we go. All right, so myth number five, using my laptop is not the cause of my neck pain. Well, believe it or not, the vast majority of people that I see that are working from home on their laptop have neck and shoulder issues. We know this because of the posture that it puts you in when you are just working off your laptop. Now, a lot of people, they went home from the pandemic or they're now in hybrid work environments and they're working from lots of different devices. And the main one is always going to be the trusty laptop. But now that, we, now that we are hybrid and we're working from lots of different locations, the use of tablets and smartphones has also become extremely popular. So my question to everyone listening today is how often have you actually stopped and thought about the health impact of using your smartphone or your tablet or your laptop for extended periods during the day? We've spoken a little bit, a little bit about um, the impact of not moving very much or not sitting in, a, in an ideal posture can have on your health. So if you extrapolate that into really what we do when we look at our phones or tablets or if we're staring down at a laptop screen, what that can do to our health. Now, the reason why laptops are so convenient, obviously we can take them away with us, we can move them around the house, uh, we can do lots of work from different positions, but unfortunately they do come with some problems as well. And I'll just talk you through a little bit um, of the issues with the laptops and then what we can do to help rectify those issues. So the first problem really we see is a small screen. Yes, it's convenient, we can carry it around, but a small screen generally tends to mean that if we're doing tasks that require a lot of reading or technical work, we're naturally gonna get drawn into the screen and we're gonna to start to move our head closer to the screen. Our screens are usually low, which means we're gonna be looking down for long periods of time and they can increase a lot of stress and tension to the muscles at the back of the neck and shoulder. If you think of your head like a bowling ball, it's actually quite heavy. So if you, if you, if you uh, cuddle a bowling ball close to your chest, you could probably carry it around all day and it's not too much of an issue. But if you hold that bowling ball out in front of you, all of a sudden that bowling ball gets very heavy very quickly. So if you think of looking down at your, um, at your laptop screen for long periods of time, like holding a heavy weight out in front of you, that's essentially what you're doing to the muscles and joints of your neck and your shoulders. And that's one of the common reasons why people using laptops for a long period of time often get pain and stiffness and headaches, um, which is clearly not ideal. Uh, one of the other reasons is, you know, a laptop being nice and small. Obviously the keyboard is quite cramped. When we place our wrists and hands on the keyboard, usually our forearms are in an awkward position. And that can also lead to things like wrists and elbow issues uh, tennis elbow or what we used to call RSI and um, you know we want to try and avoid you know keeping our I guess bodies in postures that don't serve us well and if we are on a laptop or a small device for long periods of time that can also be an issue. The other thing is that people often well I guess have become quite accustomed to is the trackpad on the on the laptop as well rather than using an, an external mouse. Now the trackpad can be quite convenient you know the new Apple trackpads have lots of funny features with a soft touch and the and the firm touch doing all sorts of wonderful things. The problem is if you look down at your wrist or your hand when you're using a trackpad, it's actually quite an awkward position. It's not a natural position for the body to be in. And when we're in that pronated position or palm down with the wrist across, it does create some tension through the tendons and the muscles of our wrist, our forearms, all the way up into our shoulder, into our neck. So what can we do about it? It's pretty simple. We can reduce the time at which we spend on our laptop. Ordinarily, two hours a day is probably the maximum that we'd want to do. Otherwise, it can increase um, the chances of injury. But we can still utilise our laptops with some very, very simple and basic external devices that can make it nice and ergonomic and will enable us to use it for longer periods of time without experiencing discomfort, which often, you know, will reduce our productivity, Cost us a little bit of money if you've got to come and see Michael or myself at the clinic um, and we don't want to uh, lose time at work or, you know, be in pain. So some of the simple things that we can do is use an external keyboard. They're really cheap and cheerful these days. You can pick them up anywhere. A nice compact external keyboard means that we can then raise our laptop up very, very easily so that the screen is at a proper height and that you can use anything. You can use a laptop stand. You can use some shoe boxes or some, um, or some books that you've got in the library that maybe you haven't read for a while. Ideally, we want the screen at eye height so that the neck is not shifted down. 
And an external keyboard certainly helps us do that. The other thing that's really important is to use an external mouse or trackpad. That means that we can keep our hand in an ideal position. One of the things that we always look at as practitioners is where someone's mouse is in relation to their body and their shoulder and where it is in relation to the keyboard. If we have an external keyboard and an external mouse, we can ensure that the hand is kept in a nice neutral position and that the elbow is not held out to the side, which again causes stress and tension in our neck and shoulders. I've spoken about raising the, the laptop up to, um, or the laptop screen up to eye level, but if you still wanna use um, the laptop uh, keyboard, what you can do is you can use uh, or adopt or utilize an external monitor. Um, an external monitor is a really great way of um, uh, increasing the size of the screen, which enables you to do more on the screen and not have to strain your eyes as much. It's also a little bit easier if it's on a, lap, uh, a monitor arm as well, to be able to move the, the, uh, the monitor around so that it suits your positioning, it's the right distance from your body, um, and that way uh, you're not going to uh, strain your eyes by leaning forward. So an ideal and very simple solution would be to have an external monitor and an external keyboard and mouse, but whatever works for you in your unique situation, um, it's always worth experimenting and trying um, something new. All right. Okay. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the standard mouse and keyboard setup that we use every day. Um, a lot of people assume that their devices are ergonomic. You know, they've, they've been de designed uh, by someone who knows about human uh, biomechanics, obviously, but that's not, not really the case. So, um, and even some of our favorite uh, devices like the Apple Magic Mouse, which I, I even have one uh, myself, um, as useful as it is with, with all its swipe functions and gestures, um, is, you know, could actually do with a, a really uh, a revamped ergonomic design. Um, as Daniel just alluded to, um, the the issue with using the mouse is that pronated or palm down position of our hand. Um, this places the muscles in our forearm in a shortened position, and those muscles lie over the nerves that go to uh, supply our hand. And when those muscles are kept in a tightened position for a long period of time, yeah, you can end up with conditions like carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, which is uh, compression of the median nerve. Um, you can also, it also uh, creates tension in, in our neck uh, and shoulders, as Daniel was talking about. Um, a simple experiment you can do if, is if you hold your arm out in front of you and feel the muscles around your shoulder, you can feel that the muscle uh, tension changes as you turn your palm from palm, uh, hand from palm down to palm up, okay? So with the palm down, you'll notice there's increased tension through your trapezius muscles here, um, as, as we're, uh, opposed to when your hand is in a neutral position. Um, and, uh, and this, the same issue is with uh, the standard keyboard design as well. Uh, as Daniel mentioned also, the, the reaching to the side of our body um, to operate a mouse, um, it further accentuates this tension in our neck and shoulder. Now the standard full-size keyboard has a keypad and, numer and um, a numeric keypad and um, cursor keys on the right-hand side that when we're, when we're in our normal typing position, prevent us from putting the mouse directly in front in a neutral shoulder position. So I'm just going to uh, tell you a little bit about some other options. Okay, so a vertical mouse is probably one of the most um, underutilized uh, ergonomic devices um, out there. And I'm, I still, I'm still surprised about how few people actually know about it. Um, so I've been using one for a long time as a, as a sufferer of carpal tunnel syndrome for many years. Um, and I've had surgery as well for that condition. I can't really tolerate using a normal mouse anymore at all. So my Apple Magic Mouse um, has been relegated to my mobile workstation and it stays in the bag. And in the meantime, I, I use one of these that you can see on the screen. So the vertical mouse, it's, it's so simple, but it just repositions your hand in a vertical handshake position. Um, you use it exactly like a normal mouse, but they're very well designed. And, and this particular model uh, by Evoluent, uh, an American company, um, has gone through four or five iterations and um, it keeps getting better with each one. Not the cheapest mouse. Uh, there are other options out there, um, but my experience with, with patients and working with um, 
chronic pain sufferers uh, that really need, uh, still want to use their computer and, and continue doing their computer-based tasks, but really can't tolerate having their hand on the mouse all day, um, it makes the world a difference. Um, another, another common thing I, I just would address as well, if people are interested in, in, in the ergonomics of using a mouse, is, um, is you often see people, and the first thing that uh, people will go to when they uh, might be having issues related to using a mouse is one of those gel wrist pads. Um, again, that, that can be okay if your desk isn't the right height. So if you've got a low desk and you need something to actually raise that arm up to the correct height so that you're not leaning forwards, then that's, that's a good thing. If on the other hand, you're just using it because you think somehow it's gonna relieve the stress in your hand and arm, then again, that's another misconception. Um, what it really does is it, it means that we leave our hand anchored on, on that wrist pad all day. And one thing you'll see in, uh, in most of us is that we use a mouse to do our work. We're not really using the mouse all the time, but we still tend to sit there with our hand clasping it like it's going to run away uh, all day. So, and, and the gel wrist pad might, uh, really contributes to that, um, that overuse uh, by just anchoring your hand there. So what, what I would say is try, if you haven't tried it before, try a vertical mouse. It does take a bit of time to get used to, uh, but the benefits are definitely there. Um, I encourage them for, for most people I speak to setting up a workspace for the new for here yeah, for the first time. Um, um, unfortunately, people often still don't buy it until they're uh, experiencing pain, until they develop symptoms. But it really is a, a really powerful um, preventative measure that you can that you can use if you're setting up your workspace. Okay. Okay, Daniel. All right now. Myth number seven, this is a really interesting one because as a chiropractor, and uh, it's very, 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 very common for uh, patients to come into my clinic um, and say, oh, I've got really bad posture. And, um, oh, my problems that I've got really bad posture. And I'm like, oh, really? What, what's good posture? And um, well, pretty much every single person um, does the whole stand up really straight. Or if they're in a sitting position, they will sit up really straight. Now, I want everyone at home to do this. I want everyone to adopt this brilliant posture. I want you to sit up as straight as you can. I want you to feel like there is a, um, a hook on the top of your head and it's pulling you straight up to the ceiling. And I want you to sit up as tall and as straight as you can. And I want you to hold that position for me. I'm going to talk about a couple of things first. And I want you to try and hold that position. I'm going to do it as well. And... Um, so it's interesting. So our, our perception of what posture is, is often based on myths like this, where we uh, just assume that we have to have this perfect posture like a ballerina or a gymnast. And unfortunately, as you may already be experiencing, it's actually very difficult to hold yourself straight upright for such a long period of time. And you might even find that your muscles are starting to get a bit tired. You might actually find that you're experiencing a little bit of discomfort in your hips or your back or your neck. And this is because it actually takes a considerable amount of muscular endurance to remain in that really straight upright position for more than a few minutes. Now, I'm going to get you all to relax. Yep, because I don't want you to hurt yourselves. But what tends to happen as we try and sit in that really upright posture, our bodies tend to become quite tight and the muscles fatigue because the muscles that are support that position are working much harder than they need to. And we often see that around our hip flexors, the muscles around the front of our hip, the muscles around our low back, but also our neck and our shoulders. Now, when these muscles, like any muscle in your body, is asked to contract for a long period of time, they become tight, they become painful, they become fatigued, and that can start to cause issues, not just in the muscles, but also in the joints. And the other pain-sensitive structures in your body, you might have heard of things like intervertebral discs, which are the little squishy parts in between the bones of our spine and also the nerves. And these are the most common reasons why people come to, um, to see practitioners or why people start to feel uncomfortable when they're in um, a position that doesn't serve them well. The idea with good posture is to try and reduce the pressure or stress on the body so that it can work as efficiently as possible. The aim really is to move as often as we can. And I know we've spoken about this in a number of slides, but movement really is the key. And, then, and the second one is it's got to be comfortable. You might find that sitting up in that nice position might look good, 
but I guarantee you it's going to be very uncomfortable very, very quickly. So what we want to do is we want to try and adopt postures that reduce the stress on our body, that help our body function as well as possible, but are also really comfortable. If you can see um, on the slide Michael's got up at the moment, um, the little graphic down the bottom when it talks about the pressure on your discs. So the discs are those soft shock absorbing um, uh, components in your body that actually help our spine move nice and freely. And you can see the level of pressure that changes depending on the angle that we sit. So one of the things that we really recommend if someone's in a seated position is to be slightly reclined. Now, I know that might sound really weird, but if you're sitting in a position that's dead upright, so you're in that 90 degree position, essentially what it does is it actually forces your back forward a little bit and it can actually be uncomfortable. So just like your car seat is naturally slightly reclined, we want our office or our, our, our workspace chair to be the same. We try and encourage people to sit in around about that 110 degree position, which tends to be um, uh, an ideal position that reduces the strain on our bodies, but also enables them to work. And um, you know, what reduces the stress the most is probably about 130 to 135 degrees, but sometimes that can be really challenging for people because it almost feels like they're lying down. So around about 110 degrees is what we'd recommend. But my advice to you, if you have a chair that reclines, is to actually play around with the angle. Go to the extremes, lean the chair back as far as you can, see what it feels like. Lean the chair forward as far as you can, see what it feels like. And then find something in the middle where your body feels comfortable and supported um, and, that, and that there's less tension, but actually enables you to do the work that you want to do. Okay. All right. And this is our last, this is our last myth or misconception. Um, posture and mental health. So on the, on the face of it, they would seem unrelated. Um, we all can probably relate to uh, a, a posture that we might associate with someone who's feeling down or depressed, you know, the, a, a sort of defeated posture of slumping forwards. But can it go the other way? So recent research is, is actually showing that our posture can actually affect our mental health um, directly. Okay. And I'll, I'll tell you about a couple of studies um, that I've come across recently. So recent, recent research has, has uh, shown that there's a clear link between our posture and our mental health. Uh, one study uh, by Harvard University, um, has shown that sitting with good posture improves symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it so you have some context. So it was, it was a study of a group of uh, students and they were asked to um, sit uh, with a stooped rounded posture. Um, and also uh, while another group were uh, later asked to sit with an upright posture. Um, and both groups underwent uh, tests to design uh, to actually uh, simulate stress levels. And then they'll filled out questionnaires to assess their responses. And the researchers found that those who sat upright um, uh, had low, reported level, lower levels of fatigue, uh, stress and anxiety. Um, another study uh, examined how students recall past experiences and, and thought uh, and about their thoughts and emotions. Uh, so the students were first asked to sit in a slumped position and, uh, and, and recall situations in their life um, and, and, and comment on the emotions that they were experiencing. They were then asked to do the opposite uh, uh, by you know, do, repeat the same activity by sitting in an upright or good posture. And what they found was that those uh, students sitting slumped uh, found it much easier to recall negative and bad experiences and negative emotions and thoughts and the contrary for those uh, sitting in good posture. Um, and yet another study has shown that um, sitting with good posture can actually improve our per persistence and resilience when dealing with difficult tasks. Uh, in this study, um, the uh, students were asked to uh, try and complete an unsolvable puzzle. So there was no way they're going to be able to do it. Um, they were first asked to attempt it uh, sitting in good posture and, and uh, vice versa in a slumped or negative sort of posture. And what it showed is that the, uh, those sitting with good posture were far more likely to persist with the challenge for much longer and have more attempts at solving, at solving the puzzle 
whereas those in uh, a negative or slouch posture gave up uh, relatively quickly. So you can see this, this can have huge implications for us, um, particularly when we're looking at people working from home. Um, as, we, as we found during the pandemic, uh, the rates of anxiety, depression, and other mental health illnesses um, reported by individuals working from home um, went through the roof compared to uh, pre-pandemic times. Um, since, um, similarly, at the same time, um, we saw many people working in uh, horrendous ergonomic circumstances in their home workspaces. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really double whammy for, for those people who are isolated um, without, without their normal uh, support mechanisms working from home uh, and working in a, in a, at a workstation or in a workspace that doesn't facilitate healthy posture. Um, it, it, it really did place them at a disadvantage. Um, while it's probably overreaching to say that ergonomics was the uh, sole cause of, <laughs> of the rise in mental health issues, I think it's it's I think it's not unreasonable to say it definitely contributed because poor ergonomics um, leads to pain uh, in many cases, which leads to uh, increased um, uh, stress, anxiety, um, and and depression in many cases if if that pain is persistent, and it creates a bit of a feedback loop. So it's one of the it's one of the messages we've been really trying to to get across is that ergonomics is not just about um, looking after people's physical health. It's really about looking after people's um, health as a person, uh, and particularly their mental health, as, as they can achieve uh, the benefits, benefits that we've been talking about. Um, I, I certainly notice it uh, towards the end of the day when I'm um, you know, starting to lose concentration and getting fatigued. Um, the first thing I'll, I'll do is to, is to sit up in a tall and confident posture as I try and give my, and naturally you feel uh, a little bit more energized uh, and can give, and can uh, focus on your task for that little bit longer to get the work done. Um, imagine the benefits if we uh, weren't hitting that wall because we're set up er ergonomically um, and, uh, and are able to build uh, our endurance and resilience when dealing with difficult tasks. So look, I encourage you next time um, uh, you, you're encountering that mid-afternoon struggle um, have a look at your posture and think about how you're sitting. In fact, any time during the day, you're feeling a bit uh, defeated. And just uh, try uh, turning the tables and actually try uh, influencing your mental health by actually improving your posture. You'll be surprised. Oh, thank you, gentlemen. That was great. I love those eight facts and myths. Um, and I was actually taking a, a lot of notes during it and the, um, the, I had, you know, Michael, I am one of those people that I too had never heard of a vertical mouse. So you're not alone. You're not alone. You're one of many. <laughs> yeah. The, um, but I think the, um, you know, for me and, and, and thank you, Daniel, for once again, you know, dashing all of my hopes and dreams that my savior is not a cup of coffee. So, um, <laughs> So, um, but the, you know, I did take away um, quite a few things and I, and I jotted down some notes and, you know, I kind of go back to, um, you know, and maybe it's just me, but I relate everything back to um, lessons you can learn from movies. And I just think of the World War Z movie, you know, life is movement, you know, you need to move and, you know, bless working where I do, you know, I can move, move from my office to some of the other breakout spaces that we've got at our, at the, at our venue. Um, and I think that's key as well, just getting up and, and moving. Um, but the, the takeaways I took was the, um, just some of those um, cadences that you outlined from the sit, sit, stand, move, and those intervals. And, um, and just the simplicity of times of just breathing and stretching. Those can have huge impacts as well. Now, um, I have talked long enough that a few questions have come through from the chat. So Michael, if you wanted to stop sharing your screen, um, we might be able to open it up a little bit. Um, so the first one that has come through is, uh, there are many online resources about setting up your workstation. How do I know what's right for me? I'll, um, I'll jump on this one, Wendy, thank you. Um, it's something that we get asked all the time um, and, you know, the companies that we work with and the individuals that we provide this service for in terms of helping them set up their ergonomics, 
a lot of them have already trawled the internet and found some um, checklists or, or some online resources about setting up their workstation um, and have, I guess, tried to do it themselves unsuccessfully. And the reason is pretty simple. Everyone's workspace and everyone's body is different. So, um, you know, if we use a, a, a generic, you know, checklist, then we might get some, I guess, generic information, but it might not be, spe be uh, as specific to our individual needs. So um, the best thing to do is actually to get a health professional um, or someone that has some training in ergonomics um, to assess your workstation specifically for your needs. Um, think of it like this, you know, you could probably find a, a checklist or a YouTube video on how to service your car. Yet, unless you're really technically savvy with regards to the mechanics, most people still take their car to a mechanic to service it because they're experts in the field and they know what they need to do to get your car right. So just like your workstation is really important, if you think of spending six to eight hours a day, sometimes a little bit more in your workspace, you want to make sure that it's set up specific to your needs. Um, so the, the best advice is to basically get someone to do it um, or to help you set it up appropriately for your needs with the equipment that you've actually got. And then they can make some simple recommendations in terms of um, whether you need something extra like uh, a vertical mouse or a laptop stand or something generally quite simple. And that's how we work with our clients. Right. Um, uh, we've got a few employers as well as employees on the call. And one of the questions has come through in terms of Whose responsibility is it for setting up an individual's home workspace ergonomically? Yeah, I mean, look, that's a really good question as well, Wendy. Thank you. Um, you know, it's an interesting one because, you know, uh, if we're in a traditional, I guess, workspace, um, the office, it's pretty obvious that the employer has the obligation to set up that workspace, I guess, uh, safely and um, ergonomically for you. Um, in terms of things like heating and lighting and uh, emergency exits and ergonomics and all those sorts of things. But home can be a little bit of a tricky one. Um, the answer is it's really a joint responsibility. Um, but the employer or, or your boss um, still has a legal obligation to provide you with a safe work environment at home. But it's what's reasonably practical, right? So their job is not to deck you out with a new everything. Their job is really to ensure that the space that you're working in is safe and is set up as ergonomically as possible. But that includes your involvement as a team member or as an employee. You can't just sit back and say, it's not my responsibility. So the answer to that question is it's certainly a joint responsibility. And, you know, every work environment has a slightly different arrangement. Some people or some organisations will provide their team members with the equipment that they need. Some will, will provide something like, um, like an allowance that they can purchase the equipment that they need. And some will provide ergonomic assessments um, and uh, informational resources from, uh, from companies like ours to be able to uh, set people up at home as safely as possible. But it's really a joint responsibility. So the, the, the team member or the worker at home has to participate in creating a safe environment. Right, teamwork, I like it. Teamwork. All right, so Michael, I'm going to fire the next one in your direction because I quite liked the look of that saddle chair. So if I need yeah. a new chair for my home workspace, what are you going to recommend? You're one step ahead of me. I was, <laughs> my automatic response to this is why sit? Why consider sitting? Therefore, you know, uh, think outside the box and well, we, we automatically think, oh, I need a new ergonomic chair. Um, and I'm going to sit at a desk. But with all everything we've been discussing, uh, all of the research into the negative impact of sitting uh, and effect it has on our health over the over our lifetime, um, I would encourage people to yeah think of something like a saddle a saddle seat uh, for sure, um, or a sit stand stool. Like a, a sit stand stool is is really um, a perching seat that's designed to be a temporary rest position between standing and, and sitting. So if you have a, uh, an up-down desk, um, you can work in standing and then just lower your bum down onto, onto, the, sit, onto the stool temporarily to rest for, for as long as you need to. Um, but the short answer is yes, I, I wouldn't be looking at a chair. Uh, and, but 
in some circumstances where it, you know you're, you're obviously uh, you might not have an up down desk, therefore uh, a sit stand stool is not, not appropriate. A saddle seat can still work with an, uh, with a standard desk height, although it's, it, uh, even at their lowest height, they do tend to be higher than a normal chair. Uh, so a saddle seat is certainly a good option if you've got a, um, a, a desk that's a little bit too high for you. Um, you might also need a footstool as well. Um, but in terms of a, if you're looking for a purely, you know, an old school ergonomic chair, um, there's, there's two varieties these days. There's a, a three lever chair that um, we're all familiar with. One, you've got levers that adjust your backrest, the seat height, the tilt and other, other parameters of the chair. Um, but then uh, more recently, you've got uh, what we call the, uh, the synchro backrest chairs. Now, what these chairs are designed to do, they've, uh, they've done away with all the levers. Um, they might have a lever, actually, they usually have one. Um, and that lever really just adjusts the tension in the backrest because these chairs are designed to respond to your body weight and actually uh, allow you to, to, be, to actually be mobile. Um, I used to really dislike these chairs because when they were first... Uh, came onto the market, they were very poorly designed. Uh, but since then, they've come a long way. And I'd have to say now I'm actually a big, big advocate of those chairs if, if they're well designed, um, uh, because they allow you to, to move. And if, if they, uh, through their good design, they should actually be adjustable so that you can, they can support your body weight appropriately. Uh, and often still have up some other adjustment features like your seat, uh, the depth of your seat pan and things like that. So the, a three lever chair though is still very good. Uh, again, um, I would, the biggest things to look for, I think in those types of chairs are ones that have uh, an adjustable lumbar, lumbar support. Uh, so often uh, chairs have a lumbar pump. It's actually a, a physical pump that you can pump up additional cushioning in your lumbar area or uh, a number of other features where you can customize the lumbar support for you and the seat material as well. So, um, you, you want to look for a, a high density foam, or often a dual density foam, where the front half of the seat is a different density to the rear of the seat. And this uh, responds to more evenly distributing our pressure uh, than a, a seat that's all the same density foam. And there's also gel tech seats, which are, um, they've been around a long time. Um, often they, they, they used to be of an expensive addition to a chair, but now they're a bit more uh, common. Um, they're kind of like a memory foam um, uh, feel to, to sitting on them. Um, not quite like a memory foam mattress that you sink into, uh, but they, they respond in the same way to heat and they, they respond to your pressure areas um, better than the standard foam. So, yeah, there are a couple of options there, but I'd say look to, look to uh, avoiding sitting in the first place. All righty, perfect. Okay, now, so... If coffee is no longer allowed, and if it's a no-no, if I'm having trouble with fatigue or concentrating towards the end of the day, what can I do to re-energize myself? Okay, this is definitely <laughs> one I can, I can relate to. Um, look, probably the probably the biggest biggest one I would say first of all um, is hydration. Um, we, if we're drinking a lot of coffee, uh, we're probably not drinking a lot of water. Uh, our brains, I can't remember the exact percentage of a significant part of, uh, component of our brain is water and our body in general. Uh, when, we, when we're not adequately hydrated, um, we, we really, uh, the, the effects of fatigue are really accelerated. Uh, so we experience that visual fatigue, that mental fog. Also dehydrated muscles uh, are much more likely to become tight and painful. Uh, so you'll actually find that if you are the sort of person that get, uh, is really dependent on caffeine. Uh, a lot of those people also experience a lot of excessive muscle tension um, and their ergonomics may have something to do with that and their ha habits of movement. But you can also look at their, their diet and their hydration as well. So that's, that's the first thing I would say, make sure you're drinking uh, adequately through the day. Right. The, uh, the other thing would be sunlight. Um, so uh, it's getting a bit of natural light is really essential. Uh, for the health of our organs, but also and our, particularly our mental health. Um, exercise, uh, simple strategies would be to break up your day uh, instead of having your meetings in your office, do a walk and talk and uh, put your headphones in and take that call uh, mid-morning uh, out, out on the road. Um, the key, as you said before, is movement. Um, 
Another thing is also visual breaks. Um, a lot of people don't um, take time to think of their eyes when they're working, and that visual fatigue can really contribute to that feeling of uh, mental fogginess. Uh, so because we're looking at screens and devices all day, the muscles in our eyes become adapted to that short focal length, and we gradually lose our distance vision. Uh, so it's really important to also remember to look out the window, look at the horizon. If you don't have a, a room with windows, that's even more reason to get outside and focus on something in the distance to, to vary that focal length. So th there's a there's a few things um, Perfect. That, I, that I'd recommend you give a, you a try. Oh, thanks for that. And I'm not sure if I can give up the copy, but maybe there's some other things <laughs> that I can supplement um, with. Um, <laughs> Now we've been, uh, Daniel, I'm going to come back to you because um, another question has come through, which talks a little bit about um, workplace um, workstation setup. So as a business owner with employees working in different locations, how can I ensure that my team's workspaces are ergonomically set up for them and safe for them? So it's one thing if you're able to get there, but if you can't get there, how can you, you know, we talked about teamwork before, but how can you do that remotely. Yep, you got it. And that's really um, how Active Health Online was started. So if you can imagine at the start of the pandemic, everyone's been sent home, you can't go into the office, everyone's in lockdown, you're at home, um, that's it. And now employees or employers then face this challenge of, well, how am I supposed to ensure the safety? Um, the way in which we do it at Active Health Online is we provide a virtual work health safety ergonomic and wellbeing assessment. So it's all done remotely. So no matter where your team is, no matter where they're located, whether in a shared office, whether they're at home, whether they're in the office themselves, we can either obviously go to the office if there's a lot of them there, but mainly for the remote teams, like the, the I think the question was about if people are in different locations, um, we do it on, all online. So it's a really simple and effective solution, where we actually have a video call with your team member or with, with the, the person working from home. And we get them to log on with their, uh, with their portable device, with their phone um, or a tablet. And then we get them to actually actively show us their workstation. And our expert assessors are able to make on the spot recommendations and give the right advice to help them set them up in their actual home without physically needing to be there. So whether you're in the country, whether you're in the city, whether you're interstate or international, it doesn't matter where your team work. Um, our service is able to, to obviously help set them up in a safe and ergonomic way. And then obviously we provide them with resources and information given what the assessors have provided to them on the day. And as an employer, you actually get a detailed report of the assessment and all the recommendations made so that it can meet the requirements that you have with regards to your um, legal obligation for work health and safety. Right. All right. I'm really mindful of the time. We've just gone a little bit over time. However, was there any, um, I think you mentioned earlier about having some information you wanted to put into the chat box for, to, to share with today's attendees? Yeah, we'll put some resources uh, for you guys in the chat box. I think Michael's got a list of those resources he can go through. And um, yep, what sure. I did want to say um, is, you know, um, one of the services that we offer and, and one of the, the, the reasons you know, I do what I do as a chiropractor and also the way or the reason I started Active Health Online was to ensure that everyone has a safe and comfortable workspace because we really believe that everyone should live a happy and healthy and fulfilled life. And we know that work takes up quite a large portion of everyone's life. So we really want to make sure that people are comfortable and feel supported. Whether you are a company or an individual, um, one of the things that we can certainly offer you, and I'm happy to, to provide um, all the attendees today with a bit of a special offer, it's a 30 minute ergonomic assessment at a reduced rate. It's $94 instead of $134. We'll put a link in the chat that you can go and book yourself in. Really gives you an idea of what we do as a company and how to set yourself up. Uh, and we can do that for anyone, it's easy. Other than that, Michael, do you have a list of those, uh, of those resources that we're gonna stick in? Yeah, I have a few, uh, a little bit of information about setting up your workstation ergonomically um, and a little bit of information about the vertical uh, vertical mouse and the compatible keyboard, which is designed to accommodate the, the um, mouse being immediately in front of you. So I'm just popping those up there now. Are they coming through? Yes, indeed, I can see those now. Yeah. And for those interested, I've also got a little bit of information about 
Active Health Online and some of the services we offer there as well in the uh, corporate uh, health and wellbeing space. Great. All right, just be sure everybody to um, save the chat by just uh, opening up the chat function and clicking on that little that little document and that'll save the chat. Um, and all I would say is um, I don't, if there aren't any other questions, I'll thank everybody for, for joining us today. Thank you very much for, for Daniel and Michael for your insights. And I hope all of you were doing what I was doing, which was sitting up a bit straighter, being a bit more mindful of my posture during this call and also um, thinking about you know, how much water I'm drinking, because I think that was a, um, also a, a key theme as well. So thank you so much to, uh, to all of our attendees again, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your time today.